I think I could almost summarize the sermon in one sentence, though I've got every intention of saying a few more sentences as well. If we could just grasp how much we owe to God in the salvation he has given us in Jesus Christ, we would scarcely need to be exhorted to present our bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable in his sight. That's the essence of our study this Sunday evening. It should be obvious by now that Paul's letter to the Romans is really in two sections. Chapters 1 to 11 lay before us what Christians believe and what Christians need to believe. And chapters 12 to 16 lay before us how Christians should live. And these two sections belong together. The believing side of the gospel and the behaving side of the gospel, these two belong together and what God has put together no one should ever separate. And the truth is that it is as we believe, as we begin to grasp increasingly the truth of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, then we will begin increasingly to be enabled to live the kind of lives that please God. You may have noticed in chapter 1, the first two verses, 16 and 17, end up by saying, He who through faith is righteous, that is, he who through faith in Jesus Christ is justified and accepted in the sight of God, that person shall live. And so we have chapters 1 to 8 which have expounded to us Sunday evening by Sunday evening the doctrines of salvation. And these doctrines have been many and they are basic. Chapters 1 to 8 of Romans begin by declaring the wrath of God against all that is unrighteous. These chapters go on to declare the sinner's guilt a terrible thing to be a sinner in the sight of God. We are the object of his wrath. We stand guilty in his presence. And the first eight chapters of Romans go on to expound, to show to us very clearly, not only that we stand in the guilt of sin, we are under the bondage and the power of sin. And being sinners, we are alienated from God. Our situation is totally and absolutely hopeless, the kind of situation that we can do nothing about. But these first eight chapters of Romans expounding the doctrines of salvation tell us how in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God himself dealt with the whole situation that faced the sinner, paying the price of sin so that the sinner can be forgiven, and breaking the power of sin so that the forgiven, justified sinner is set free to live. And these first eight chapters of Romans emphasize again and again in very wonderful terms that all the benefits and all the power and all the blessing of salvation is given to the Christian believer by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Salvation, you see, is not something that influences us from outside. Salvation is something that influences and works and operates from within us. God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling permanently in our hearts to work out in our lives and in our personalities all the grace of the Lord 
Jesus Christ. And this salvation that we are given in Jesus Christ is in every sense a full salvation. It lacks nothing. And when we come to Romans chapter 8, it begins by saying there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and that's a great relief. And the chapter ends, there is no separation from the love of God for those who are in Christ Jesus, and that is comfort and blessing indeed. Then we come to Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. These very difficult chapters that we've struggled with. And in these chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, we are given something of a panoramic picture of the outworking of God's plan of salvation in history. From the beginning, when the world was first called into being, right down through the course of history to the present day, and right through to the end, the culmination or the climax of history. And when we come to the end of Romans chapter 11, in these marvelous verses 33 to 36, it is clear that Paul is saying that we are really meant to stand amazed at this gospel of salvation. Now, Wesley, Wesley has done the church a great service down through the generations. If, if he had done nothing else, having given us the words of, and can it be, that, that's a lifetime ministry, and his ministry is still going on. And even if he'd only given us the couple of lines, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? It was quite encouraging, was it not, to hear the President of the United States saying, when God was here on earth, he said, blessed are the... Oh, you said, it was Jesus who said, blessed are the... Yes, but the president was right. For that Jesus is none other than God himself. God, the... When I heard him, I said, oh, in my heart, I wish I could hear some British politicians talking about God like that. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should, should die for the likes of me? Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past Finding out. Sometimes, you know, a feminist has to say to some people, and not always young people, what on earth did you do that for? But in a sense, Paul is saying here to God, but, 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 but why? Why, why, why do that? Why, why, why send the eternal Son by whom the worlds were called into being and by whom the worlds cohere? Why, why send him, the very light and the glory of eternity, down to such a world as this? I suppose a lot of you are beginning, I suppose I am as well in measure, beginning to think, oh, now about, about Christmas cards and Christmas presents. Hold, hold on a minute. Before we get all swamped, think about Christmas. That God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to pay the price of your sin and mine, to clear your overdraft of guilt, and take the whole burden of guilt off you, 
and to break the chains of sin and the power of sin that can so often ravage our personalities. That's what Christmas is all about. We read in the Bible study in the prayer meeting last night from is it the letter to Titus, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. Now it's with this kind of thought in mind that Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Oh, he says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice which is your reasonable service or your spiritual worship. I'm quite sure in these closing verses of chapter 11 that we are meant to stand altogether amazed at the gospel. You know, we're a cynical generation. We've devalued so much. We've devalued human love and made it a thing of lust. We've devalued family life. We've devalued marriage. Yes, we've devalued the Christian church. We've devalued the Bible. I just fear that we've devalued the cross of Jesus Christ. We'll sing at the end of the service, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. We'll sing, See from his head, his hands, his feet, Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Do you know, I think... I think we've, we've lost our capacity to wonder, to be amazed. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, says the old Negro spirit, sometimes, oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Do you ever feel like that? Oh, I, I hesitate to use the words, but isn't there a danger that we, we lapse into this devaluing attitude and we think of the cross and say, well, well, that's the kind of thing that God would do. That's the least he could do. Oh, my friends, be careful. You know, gospel privileges can often make us careless. That's why some of us need to be sent away from gospel privileges to live in a spiritual wilderness, not for a week or two, but for a few years. I can still remember a man who, when he was here, was, oh, he was cynical and critical. And nothing, nothing seemed to please him, especially the minister. And then after the Christmas Eve watch night service, when he turned up, he came and spoke to me and shook my hand. And I was able to look right into his face. And he said to me, just want you to know that people don't, don't realize how much they have here till they're away from it. He wasn't cynical or critical anymore. This is what Paul's trying to get through to us. He's saying, oh, the gospel of salvation, the price that was paid, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgment, how inscrutable his ways, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. You see, pa Paul mighty intellect and mighty theologian and mighty missionary as he was, stands here amazed. And if nothing else comes of this service tonight, oh, I pray that we'll, we'll learn, even in just a little bit, 
to stand there at the place where they crucified him and be amazed. Paul, Paul's whole focus is on God. I found myself turning over, you don't need to turn it up to the opening verses of the epistle to the Hebrews. And I always quote them in the old authorized version which begins, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spoke in time past through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. That Son reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. When he had by himself made purification or atonement for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And right through Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul, by the Holy Spirit, has sought to lay before us the whole plan of it, the whole plan of salvation, secured for time and for eternity. And that's how he comes to verses 33 to 36, contemplating this glorious salvation as we have tried to do tonight already, contemplating this glorious salvation, a salvation so full and so sure. Paul, I hope this is the right word, Paul launches into a doxology of praise and of worship. And he recognizes that there is so much we simply cannot understand. We can catch glimpses of the glory of salvation. But you know, when we get to heaven, and we see at the very heart of the eternal throne of God the Lamb as it had been slain. Oh, we'll see then. What's the, the line in Rutherford's great hymn? The Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. And Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Now, how can a mere mortal, a limited mortal at that, expound the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God? I turn back in Paul's letter to the Romans to chapter 2, is it at verse 4, where he says, do you presume upon the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not know that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Oh, the depth of the riches. Does, does it refer to his kindness or his grace, or his love, or his patience, his forbearance, his long-suffering, his gentleness. Oh, we, we use a lot of words to try to describe God in our opening prayer. I hope you share in the opening prayer of a service. His tenderness, his love, his goodness. Oh, says Paul, <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't begun to see it yet. Oh, the depth. It's, it's, it's so deep. It's so deep there's really, there's really no ending to it. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. And Paul goes on to say his ways are past finding out. Be, 
beyond, beyond human understanding. And all you need to do is to look back, for example, we, we didn't actually read it, to chapter 5 of Romans, at verse 6, where we have this astonishing statement in the second half of the verse. Christ died for the ungodly. Did you understand that? It doesn't say that Christ died for the people who are trying very hard to be good. It it didn't say that Christ died for those people. Well, they they may not be all they should be, but at least they're, they're religious and they're devout and they're there Sunday after. No, no, it doesn't say that. Jesus himself said that he didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8. God shows or demonstrates or commends or or placards. There are some hideous placards. I've got to look at one when I stop at the lights at Broomhill Cross. Shame on those who pay money to, to distort and make a mockery of some of the holy words pertaining to Christmas. God placarded. Oh, and what a placard it was. It had an upright and a crossbar. God placarded his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 